In June of 1944, the Western Allies launched their invasion of Normandy. Their objective to drive Germany, Hitler and the Nazis back to Berlin and bring the Second World War to an end. It was the biggest seaborne invasion in history, an exercise of almost unimaginable scale and complexity involving hundreds of thousands of men and women. But 70 years later, the Normandy landings remain an absolute classic case for students of strategy. Gibbs Dean, Professor Nick Binadel, joins us now. Nick, hello and welcome. Hi, Chris. You visited Normandy earlier this year. Did you get a sense on the beaches of the size of this thing? Well, there's something about going to the place of a battle that does give you a sense of perspective. And absolutely, it's an 80-kilometer stretch with five different landing zones. And I went to the American sector and the British sector at Aramanche. And in the British sector, you can still see the harbors that they towed across, the remains of them. It's an extraordinary location, and you begin to understand the scale of this operation. All right, so let's think about this strategically. As early as 1940, four years before, uh, before the Americans even had been brought into the war by Pearl Harbor in 1941, Churchill had realized that a massive invasion would have to take place somewhere at some time, the process of thinking, of planning, of examining your options started very early on. It did. They appointed a, a General Morgan, who had an interesting title of the head of Cossack, uh, which was the unit, and he and a few people sat in a caravan for months thinking about when the point came, which was, as you say, a long way away, what would be the right approach. And they had a five or six major strategic geographic options which they spent months considering. One was through Norway, one was through Italy, one was through Marseille in the south of France, and two in, where, in the channel. The one was in the narrower part of the channel, the Pas de Calais, which is the shortest route across, which is what the Germans expected. And then the last one they settled on was Normandy. By 1943, a full 18 months ahead of the invasion, formal planning had started. It had not only started, but been done in quite a lot of detail. And there were all these summits going on between the political leaders as to the long-term nature of the war with Russia, America, and Britain meeting Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, planning not only the war, interesting enough, but the post-war world in which they wanted to construct. But the big question was, as you said earlier, how do they finally defeat Germany? The, the politics of this is interesting because in, in any undertaking in the corporate world, politics comes into play. Absolutely. So this was the border government as opposed to the executive management, which was the military. There were tensions between the different services, Air Force, Navy and Army. There were also tensions between the different allies as to who would be in charge. And as we know, uh, Eisenhower was put in charge in American. They had brought a lot of the material and muscle. And Montgomery was the leader of the British Army. He had a major role. And towards the end of this campaign, as they were going in, they brought in Patton, who they had excluded, and he was a major contributor to the success. And there was a great deal more to it, of course, than simply assembling this giant fleet and sticking tens of thousands of men on board. Right. So it was a multi-phase strategy which involved the French resistance. The Allies parachuted large numbers of people to help the French resistance uh, disrupt the German defense, including young women who were sent who spoke French. Many of them did not survive. And then there was the first phase, which were paratroops sent in, saving Private Ryan. You see all of that stuff going on with the paratroopers. Uh, they were behind the enemy lines to disrupt it and prevent also on the sides the Germans coming from the side. And then the main army came in, bombardment, naval bombardment for many, many hours. I sat in those bunkers and thought what that must have felt like for the German defenders. And then the wave off the beach. And then the big thing is getting off the beach and preventing the Germans from pushing them back. They achieved about 70% of their objectives in the first two days. And of course, this minor matter of towing into place two complete harbors from which things like uh, trucks and tanks could be unloaded, because you can't drop them in the water and Correct. put them on the, on the soft beaches. At first, the planners had said, or they'd been told, it couldn't be done. It can't be done. There were two wonderful inventions or developments for this. They chose Normandy because the beaches were flat and were more likely defended, although still very well defended. And uh, the British developed the Mulberry Harbour, which were concrete blocks, but like huge Lego blocks, which they towed across and then created these instant harbours. One lasted a few weeks and was destroyed in a storm, and the other lasted through for a long period. Uh, because they had to follow up so quickly with half a million men from the initial landing force. So that was a total innovation, never been done before. The other people don't know was the landing craft, the front-ended landing craft, were developed to get troops off fast enough in a landing. In the old days, they'd take them off the side of the ship, but it was too slow. 
So that was a major innovation that had been developed. And of course, as with any major project, some elements of good luck. The German high command was at sixes and sevens because of Hitler's obsessive nature, wanting to control everything. And Hitler himself, the night before the invasion, had gone to bed and said, don't disturb me tomorrow morning. Right. It's just one of those accidents of fate that's so an effect the strategy is uh, luck, uh, or bad luck or good luck. And uh, as you say, Hitler slept, uh, gave an instruction. And there was rivalry between uh, the various generals. Rommel was there, come back from North Africa, very favored general. And he had another general, and the two of them was not clear. What the Germans had done very cleverly is kept their main forces back because they didn't know where they would come or when, uh, so that they could then respond in a more agile way. Uh, but there's a lot of coordination problems with the Germans. And they had a, a mixed group of troops, some very seasoned panzer uh, tank uh, regiments and some younger East European and younger troops that were not that fighting fit. So June 6th, 1944, the invasion happens. Thousands die on both sides. Many thousands more die over the next six to eight weeks in the fighting in, in Normandy. But the main objective is achieved. Is that the key takeaway? Well, I think the, the main objective, absolutely. You know, you've got to stick to what's the core. And you know, in any battle or any budget or any year, uh, things don't all work out. And part of agility is changing the shape of your strategy as events unfold. And that's what we learn from military is that each army has a plan and neither's plan works once they engage with each other. It's like a rugby match. So you've got to be inventive in the course of the campaign. And that's where the bringing pattern in and the right hook uh, made a huge difference because the British got a bit stuck and uh, the Americans uh, moved almost in blitzkrieg speed. And Patton stole petrol from other parts of the army in order to follow his very strong world personality of moving very quickly. And they cut through and around the Battle of the Bulge. Fantastic story. And of course, it took months for them to get to Berlin. And there was a lot of fighting along the way. And naturally, the closer the Germans got to the homeland, the fatherland, the harder they fought. Uh, which is very often the case. Often you can make early wins in a strategy and then strong resistance builds up when you go after market share and you're really in people's territory. A fascinating lesson from history, but for today. Still yeah, valid today. Thanks, Chris.